Hey everyone, welcome to The Water Voice. I'm Greg. And I'm Kevin. And we look forward to talking with you about all things water. And startups. And much more. Let's go. Water voice, we're back. What what episode is this? Not sure. We Not, stopped counting. Stop. S- season two, deepening the narrative. Deepening the narrative, going far and wide. And today we have a special guest, Vermont Trotter. Hello. Hello, co-founder of Northwest Carbon. And I'm going to let you give the whole backstory and we'll get into all that. But Northwest Carbon uh, has an important role to play, I think, when it comes to the circular economy, which we'll talk about. But you guys produce specialty carbon products. That is the goal. We're not actually producing yet, but that is, we've, we've been in the carbon field for almost two years now. And I was bitten by the biochar bug. And as I tell everybody, be careful, it will bite. And it's got a venom that'll go down deep into your veins. My background on this is um, I spent probably about... 10 years as a logging contractor out in the uh, forests of North Idaho. And when I was introduced to this concept of biochar and the things that you can do, I saw immediately this application in the woods out here in North Idaho and in, in eastern Washington. Um, it's taking advantage of uh, low value to no value wood waste and turning it into something that it can be used. <clears throat> and then quickly studying it, it became very apparent that it's not just biochar, it's what you do with it. You have to continue to process it beyond the mouth of the reactor in order to hit some of these higher values and, and to be able to accomplish things that the um, that biochar can do. Uh, and I call it, I use that an all-encompassing term called polishing the char. And that ranges from what you, you things you can mix with it before it goes into the mouth of the reactor, the way you cool it, things you can do with it after the mouth of the reactor, um, things you can blend it with um, and densifying it, pelletizing it. And the, you know, the primary step in all of that is pelletizing and creating something which, um, and to enable you to touch those higher, better use markets, which range from uh, two-dimensional printing with, for electronics to medical to water treatment to storm water treatment to um, concrete, asphalt. I mean, the applications just go on and on and on. The stuff that they have found, mine land reclamation, cleaning up brownfields, um, it just doesn't stop, quite frankly. And don't get me started. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> I it know. goes on and on. Let's backtrack. What is biochar? Biochar, um, most people would know it as charcoal. Mm-hmm. You Where you take uh, woody biomass and you heat it up to... Uh, with charcoal, it's about 200, 250 degrees Celsius in, in an oxygen-deprived environment. Uh, modern biochar takes those temperatures up to around 900, 1400, even as high, depending on what you have to work with and what you're looking to accomplish, as high as 2400 degrees C. Uh, so you are v- taking all of the volatiles out of it completely and using that to reheat the reaction chamber up to those higher temperatures. So it becomes a self-sustaining process and you end up with pretty much nothing but pure carbon. Uh, And that then allows you to do things with it. Um, uh, One way you might think of it is activated charcoal at about half the price. Interesting. And um, so biochar, you talk about uh, wood waste. Yes. But it can be other items, right? Other biomass? Absolutely. You can biochar pretty much anything, uh, ranging from corn stover to hemp uh, to humanure. You know, the humanure sludge that comes out of waste, waste uh, wastewater treatment plants. Mm-hmm. Uh, and not all biochars can do the same thing. Uh, you know, not all biochars create the same quality char. Not all biochars can meet the same design requirements for what you are looking to produce. Uh, you really you have to start out with what are you trying to produce? What product are you trying to produce? And also importantly, where are you looking to produce that product? And then you 
backtrack it to, okay, what's my feedstock source? What can I use? What's available to be used? And then you work it back towards your end goal of what's the final product that I'm looking to get out the gate. Mm -hmm. Um, And so things like crop residue absolutely uh, obviously can be used absolutely you hit on it a little bit so depending on what the uh, product is and what the use would be you know you're going to use a different type of of char you Correct. guys recently i believe and and we don't need to name you know we don't have to get very specific but you guys are doing a pilot yes we are in Coeur d'Alene, idaho correct and this has to do with water treatment uh it's uh, actually stormwater treatment to remove phosphorus from the from the storm waters are going into the lake. Um, we're using, we've got a very short run, a very enclosed run of stormwater um, capture, you know, the, the stormwater grates and the little system is six holes. <clears throat> we've got, um, we've stuffed our char inside of socks, permeable socks, and we're seeing about an 88% reduction of phosphorus along with picking up the big four, the lead, cadmium, arsenic, and zinc. Uh, it absorbs those as well. Uh, the state of Idaho um, has also very recently allocated a right fair chunk of money to upgrade water quality throughout the state. Um, the phosphorus that's going into Lake Coeur d'Alene, it's not the cities. It's not the water treatment plants. The problem is in the, um, is in the fields, the farmer's fields that oh. dri- drive down into the drain into the lake. And what we're trying to do right now and finding the correct people to get up with are twofold. One is the highway districts to lay these socks in the drainage ditches. So you're cleaning all the material coming in off the, the roadways, but also up into the farmer's fields and, and to lay these socks into the drainages of the farmer's fields, which does some really cool things. The first thing it does is it captures all the nutrients that are headed down into the lake and causing you know things like algae blooms or the follow on on that. Uh, and then, uh, it, so it recaptures it at the end of the season. You then spread it back out in the fields and you get all the benefits of biochar into the farmer's fields. In addition to a second shot at the nutrients that had otherwise been washing out of your field. So it allows you to rebuild the, uh, the, the soil uh, of the fields out there on the Palouse, as well as a second shot at the, um, at the nutrients that you've been laying on the ground. Kind of a long shot deal, um, just getting started on that, but that's part of my pet projects. How big are these socks? These socks are, the ones we're making right now, they can are five inches in diameter. You stuff them full, it's like stuffing a sausage. Uh, we're making them right now in the two to four foot range, but uh, when if we get to full production on it, we would be doing pallets, each sock being about 200 plus feet long. And then uh, each individual, you know, you cut it off to whatever length you need. And... Uh, one of the other things that's also interesting is um, uh, there's over in Seattle, they've recently identified, I'm going to get these names wrong because it's not in front of me, but it's 6-TTP quinone. I think that's right. Yep. And the 6-TTP is a um, it is a an additive they put into automotive rubber to keep ozone from deter- you know causing it to deteriorate. Mm-hmm. Uh, and on rubber tires, it, that little granules of the rubber tire wear and fall off onto the road. And it's the leachate from that that is killing the coho salmon before yep. they're giving a chance to breed. And also very uh, deleterious to rainbow trout. And they don't know how many other fishes. Some of them are more uh, resistant to it than others. Uh, but with the coho salmon, it's wiping them out. Um, the city of Seattle, they want uh, the tire manufacturers to eliminate the 6-TTP completely, uh, which is sort of a, a way you can go about it. I think a much better way would be to line the storm drains and the drainage ditches with the carbon socks, with the biochar socks, to capture that because um, we're pretty sure we're, we're able to capture that. We'll be testing for that um, probably in October. I'll our, be very interested in that. That's a big yeah. deal over there. It is a big deal over there. It's a big deal for pretty much every watershed. Yeah. You know, it's uh, it's all about protecting the water. When I was a logging contractor, that was the thing that the state of Idaho would teach uh, in the classes that way they would make loggers go to. It's all about the watershed. you got to protect the watershed. And that's what it's all about, the watershed. Yeah. We, so go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. Earlier, you mentioned that magic term we've been hearing a lot about, carbon. Right. Yes. So explain to us a little bit about 
the relationship between biochar and carbon and then ultimately what benefits the production of carbon in in the biochar creation well carbon is one of the more plentiful elements in the universe you know we're all carbon based entities you know munching around on cheese and lettuce and things like that. So carbon is in, you know, car organic chemistry is all about carbon. It's all based around the C atom. Um, and what we're doing is, you know, circular economy is something you guys talked about early in, in, in this is, is create, you know, closing the loop and, and getting away from a one-time use and throwing it to the, to the landfill. Um, this material that we're going after is residual wood that's left out in, left out there or pulp wood, of which we've got a great deal of running from New Mexico all the way to, to British Columbia with the, um, the bark beetle kill uh, that went through the lodgepole. So there's a lot of standing dead and a lot of residual wood that is just waiting for a fire. Now you can release that particulate in the carbon up into the sky or you can capture it and control the uh, combustion so that you reduce the amount of carbon that's going into the sky and you're capturing that carbon, which then allows you to do things with it. And this comes into the carbon capture, um, CO2, you know, uh, miti you know, mitigating the amount of CO2 that's going up into the sky and that whole issue of uh, carbon sequestration. So you're able to use it and put it into things like concrete, and asphalt and you know the footings that you guys are talking about and some of the material that you're putting in uh, really interesting stuff that I'm learning uh, about more and more uh, on how it can be used in stormwater treatment um, it captures all of the heavy metals that are washing off of the streets is capturing the uh, the zinc is capturing the phosphorus I mean we're not required to do a complete profile of testing of everything that is capturing. We're trying to uh, match with what the city of Coeur d'Alene is doing. But, you know, I've, in Minneapolis or up in Minnesota, just recently came across one. They're getting a 100 percent capture of E. coli coming in their stormwater swales and you know, building these swales in. Um, and one of the most interesting things about it is they have discovered that once you install the carbon into a stormwater swale or capturing underneath is that mother nature takes over you get little bugs that go live in the nooks and crannies uh, if you go to our website uh, northwestcarboninc.com uh, you'll see pictures of biochar and it looks kind of like it's like a magnified picture of uh, uh, thomas's english muffin and all those nooks and crannies nooks and crannies nooks and crannies and that's you know little bugs will go in there and live and they'll you know you feed them with whatever it is that they like and they just proliferate and as i said mother nature just takes over and does her thing and so you're using the carbon to um, facilitate that sort of um, stuff that would happen all by itself uh, but you're, you know, you're giving the bugs a little hotel to go live in and they just go in there and have a grand time having a party. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty amazing. I mean, uh, full transparency, we are uh, in early stages of testing uh, a certain type of biochar in our permeable mix design. And that's sort of our path or our goal to get to a net zero carbon footprint in the product. Um, so the sequestration thing makes a lot of sense. But biochar, it seems like there would be an abundance of, you know, this material to make char. And so, and all these different uses. So why don't we see a proliferation of char end use products everywhere? Because we have four or five generations worth of just throwing stuff into the landfill yeah. and getting people past that mindset of this is the, what, this is what we're going to do because this is what we've always done this done it this way. I was in a meeting just yesterday with the gal from the Forest Service, and she was saying the same thing. It's like, you know, getting over this institutional habit of this is the way we've always done it. So this is what we're going to do. And, you know, who are you to come and tell us we, you've got a better idea? There's, that's not so. And, uh, you know, you can't tell from listening, but I've got a bit of white in my beard. And it's up to you guys, you young guys, to come in here and change the attitude because that is the crux of it, is changing the attitude of the way we live our lives. You know, you don't, it's not one use and throw it to the landfill because 
it, the landfill feeds into the watershed, which of course, you know, from my experience as a logging contractor, it's all about the watershed. You got to protect the watershed. You got to protect the watershed. Mm -hmm. Let me say it three times. Let's make it true. We have to protect the watershed. And so if you are able to capture these things and rather than let them just deteriorate or God forbid a fire go in and hit these things, uh, where you have just this uncontrolled release, if you're able to control it and you, that then enables you to do something with it and complete, you know, close off the loop. It's mm. the circular economy. Mm -hmm. and, give us a, give us an idea of abundance of potential biochar. <laughs> Humanure. <laughs> we ain't ever running out of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. We've got yeah. a lot of human ore we got to get rid of. As long as they're humans, right? Exactly. And right now what they do is they throw it into compost to cook out all the pathogens and it leaves behind the, um, the endocrine disruptors and the, um, PCBs and all the other, um, uh, for what they call the forever chemicals, slipping out of my mind. But, um, you know, they throw those into the compost and then you take that compost and you put it in your garden. And that's fine if you're growing flowers, but if you're growing vegetables that you're going to eat, you're now taking the uptake that those plants are pulling those things right back up into them. And now you're putting it back into your body. Mm -hmm. And this then becomes a serious problem because, you've, you know, you've now got a, a circular economy you really don't want to be involved with. So if you take the humanure and you char it, you get rid of those forever chemicals, you get rid of those endocrine disruptors, and then you can then take that and put it into your garden and it's much safer. You'll get, especially if you nitrilize it to begin with, nitrilizing is a very polite way of saying it, filling it full of nitrogen. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so now you've got a much safer uh, long-term release fertilizer as you can throw in your, in your garden. You can also take that low quality char and you can use it for um, the lower quality applications, you know, the things that don't require uh, the 90% carbon, 10% ash, uh, you're with a human or you'd be talking about more like a 60% carbon and a 40% ash. Um, and that's fine depending on what you're using it for. Um, but that gives you an example of an abundance. And then let's talk about wheat chaff, you know, the, the, the cut it clippings from wheat that are sitting out here on the Palouse. I mean, it's like every year, it just, they are looking for something to do with it. Uh, you can take that and char it and throw it right back out into the fields. Um, all of your agricultural clippings, rice husks, is, is a good source of, of feedstock. And it works great for um, water purification, not going to work so great for other things. Um, sugar beet tops. Um, it just goes on and on. I mean, this country produces an awful lot on, and on a yearly basis is creating an awful lot of... Um, cellulostic material that can then be charred and you really can you can char pretty much anything so is what you're saying biochar is abundant it just is a matter of us looking for it the feedstock is abundant there is almost no infrastructure for biochar itself uh, if we're able to produce, if the country as a whole is able to produce 100,000 ton a year, I would be surprised. Uh, many times you run across somebody uh, who says, gosh, son, I love what you got there. You got a great product. Can you have me 300 ton by Thursday? And the response is, uh, no, we might be able to get like 30 pounds maybe. Yeah. And well, yeah. oh, I see. Well, I'll tell you what, you come see me when you got... 300 tons by Thursday, we'll be delighted to talk to you. Of course. Yeah. So, so yeah. the infrastructure to create it does not exist. Mm -hmm. And that's one of my goals, of, or our goals, is to create an infrastructure. Yeah, I, I think uh, you're definitely on to something. So the question, though, is then is that an economics issue? Like why? Why is the infrastructure not in place? Um, can you talk about the whole process and sort of the cost, I guess, to get? You go through pyrolysis to get Correct. char. Is that an expensive process? The process itself, you can put in um, truck mounted small reactors at a relatively inexpensive cost, but to really be able to take advantage of the infrastructure that you've got to be able to, you know, you, you need, you get economies of scale. Uh, and the, it's to get a 20,000 ton a year plant is going to be about $20 million. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a lot of money. To be able to to um, to be able to justify 
when you don't have someone who's there who can off take the product. Now, there's a lot of when you're actually making biochar, the, you know, biochar isn't the only thing that you're making. You're also creating, you know, we've, we found some technology out of Canada that also allows you to um, create um, renewable natural gas. Uh, and so that allows you to then, you know, you feed that material directly into the natural gas pipelines or create a uh, local localized power source using a, a renewable natural gas. Uh, and so now you've got essentially a net zero uh, car addition of carbon into the atmosphere because you're taking material that would otherwise, you know, this produced anyway, and you're capturing the carbon and you're, you're creating natural gas. And then you're also creating an awful lot of residual heat. Mm -hmm. And um, I can tell you from you know, my experiences as an aircraft mechanic, below these many years ago, you never let heat go to waste. And when you've got 900 degrees C coming off the mouth of the reactor, the exhaust of the reactor, that's an awful lot of heat that you can do an awful lot of things with. You can generate power, you can, um, there's just, you don't let that kind of residual heat go to waste. You don't send it, vent it to atmosphere. Yep. You can use it for drying. You can use, uh, um, you can use it to produce other products. You can use it to uh, do climate control for, uh, you know, vertical uh, agriculture. It, you know, it goes back to what you were talking, Kevin, with the circular economy. You, know, you don't let anything go to waste. Uh, and you know you find you, the temperature of the air of, that you're finally exhausting in, into the atmosphere. If you can get close to 200 C, um, you know you're really doing something. You get down to about 200 C, and you, you've you've pretty much exhausted your heat. There's still a little bit there. You can use it to heat water, or you know heat your the atmosphere that you're operating in. You, know, you can do things like that, but it's not a lot left after 200 degrees. Really interesting. I think the uh, the renewable natural gas component is uh, extremely compelling. I recently um, found out about a company called, I think, Charm Industrial, and they're in the carbon removal space. And uh, what they're doing, I think they're taking crop residue, but they're taking it all the way through the pyrolysis stage to get it into like a bio oil. Correct. That they're then basically putting in the ground and that's how they're storing carbon. Um, have you heard about this at all? A little bit. The, uh, the, the oils can, they have their own oils and, um, the bio vinegar that can be pulled off of that. There are things you can do with it. You can use, burn those oils and create, you know, heat. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the wood vinegar you can produce, you, it acts as a, if you dilute it enough, it can act as a, an insecticide. Um, you know, but again, you're 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 having to generate various um, markets for those products, and then just burying it in the ground. I mean, there's other things you can do with it. Why would you put perfectly good carbon to to waste? You know, directly into the ground. It's one way to do it. It's a great question. And I don't it's, know. it's a legitimate way to do it. But you know, there are other things you can do. There are higher, better uses you can put this carbon to use rather than they're just burying it in the ground. Yeah, and that's why I really am impressed with what you you guys are doing at Northwest Carbon. And I think that for us, um, again, you talk about sort of circular economy and how everything in a way is interconnected. Um, Absolutely. You know, carbon removal to us means um, just not producing CO2 in the first place in an industrial process. And then if you can sequester it on the back end, more the better. Um, but anyway, I, I'm just, um, I stay impressed with sort of your guys' vision and your approach. I want to talk about your vision because I feel like we had, and I'm talking big vision, because <laughs> I feel like we had a conversation like two weeks ago and you laid out a, uh, a vision of having a, you know, a char plant that would produce RNG that then would also potentially have vertical farming. Yeah. You're going to go. Sure. You, I'll, you, you I'll, go, I'll go there. This is this, and this is big, big vision, big picture. So let's take a, a very specific application that we've done an awful lot of homework on. And that's right here in Kootenay County in, in North Idaho. Um, the, there is an awful lot of wood waste out there. Um, and, 
the goal would be to create a light industrial park with the char plant being the primary tenant. And then the char plant would be producing the RNG, the heat, the power, the char, to for its own purposes, and then using that LNG to create power. And then you use the locally produced power to either uh, subsidize or supplement or you know be carry as much of the load as you can for the other people who are in the industrial park. And then one of the things that you know we talked about that I would love to see would be vertical farming. Uh, and if anybody's not familiar with vertical farming, it's where you go into a warehouse and you build the, you know, like think Sam's Warehouse, Costco, whatever, they've got these huge steel racks. But when you're talking vertical farms, now you're talking about uh, a s- s- four foot by six foot tray that has soils and, and um, water, well, not water, but irrigation into the tray. And then above it, you have LED grow lights. And then you have this vertical rack that'll have 40 of these things on a little carousel that go that go around and go around and go around. And you re- the, the operator reaches over and punches a button and brings down the rack that he has to work on. And he's you know, tending to his garden right there. And then you push the button and the next one comes down. And so you're constantly tending these vertical racks of gardens. And now you can do things like grow strawberries and lettuces and these high value um, organic crops because we would be also taking the, this biochar and mixing it with um, some of the organics that we're able to do. We've got a, another guy that we're working with over in Spokane, excuse me, in Coeur d'Alene, who has a, um, a soil amendment that allows you to totally do it with pesticides. And so you can have pesticide free, fully organic, OMRI certified um, b- blueberries, strawberries. Um, Green, green, you know, butter lettuce, romaines, all these various high value vegetables in the middle of the winter. Yeah. Because you've got the heat that you can then, you know, keep the, keep it warm, keep it at the temperature you want. Uh, you have, you know, heat for the power. I mean, so these are very closed in, uh, you know, just, you know, co located. You know, you've got, you've got the source there, you know, with the LNG, you can send it to the grid with the power of the generate, you can send it to the grid, but keep it close. It's sort of the, uh, the larger vision, keep it close and, it. and do things that, um, benefit the entire community. So imagine, you know, coming to your local rose hours here in Spokane and you have locally grown strawberries in February. It, it may seem far fetched and out in the future, but if you drive by Gonzaga University, the Hemmingson building that they built, I think four or five years ago now, there's a greenhouse on the far east end of the building. And in the evening, you see a hue of those lights that ricochet off the top of the greenhouse. Right. Uh, And I had an opportunity to take a tour of the building, and that's exactly what they're doing. Now, it's not in vertical fashion, right? They don't have them on rotation. Uh, but these concepts are, uh, and you talk about younger generations, that students are fired up about sustainable practices and they do see practical future applications for them. This also ties back into Malthus, you know, to really you know, bring the past and the future together. Malthus has added, you know, his, he's a bit of a blowhard, but it can be summed up in a real short, you know, concept. And that is population produ- Population increases geometrically, um, and food production produce re, you know, grows arithmetically, meaning you you very quickly can outgrow your food production. Mm-hmm. But what he didn't count on were the advances that they have discovered in how to produce food. So now, you know, you, you no one's ever thought about vertical farming before, and you can put in Lord knows how many acres worth of crops if you're stacking them on top of each other. And so you know, it's I, just, yeah. a, a, just another way of increasing food production and good food, because let's face it, plants are good for you and good food that, you know, is, are nutritious and in the middle of the winter. Absolutely. There should be no reason for anyone to fear a food shortage in 2022. But yet here we are. Here but, we are. But it comes down to, again, sort of these centralized systems and supply chains and the way the old way of doing things, um, which is 
totally whole different topic that we could get into as well. But I think that vision is, um, it, it, that's inspiring. And I don't think it's that far fetched. And I don't think it's that far into the future. It's a very doable. Yeah. And, and, you know, I remember as a kid back in the sixties, um, my mom squealing with delight when she saw stra- fresh strawberries in the grocery store. It's like, yay! And, you know, that went away in the 70s. Suddenly they're here year round. It's just, and uh, there's, a, you know, something, in, you know, it was in the news at this point, maybe 15 years ago. You know, what's the mileage on your plate? You know, how far did your food come to get to your plate? And it's sometimes it's really crazy how far your food has come. You know, strawberries from Peru. Mm-hmm. You know, well, wouldn't it be much greater to have strawberries from just down the street in February? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and it, you know, just connecting the dots and closing the the loops that we have now can really challenge that narrative. Even just the concept. You've talked a lot about a circular economy. Our uh, Washington State Department of Commerce. They're very focused on a concept called industrial symbiosis. Very similar concept. You're creating a product, but you also create sub products right. out of its use. And the human race has simply not had that focus for so long that challenging the narrative can push us into eating strawberries that are delicious and beautiful that we may have year round, but they don't taste like water. <laughs> you know, if you go to Costco and you buy uh, strawberries out of season, they may look big and beautiful, but you know, a lot of that is water weight. Right. And uh, so if we reshape our minds to realize what, what we're purchasing, how we're making those decisions, it goes a long way. It also talks to the circular, you know, going back to the circular economy, it's like, what do you do with your slag? One of the jobs I had in the timber industry was getting rid, my official title was residuals manager, but I called it taking out the trash. Because if you don't get rid of the wood waste that's created from, create, uh, from a sawmill operations, you find yourself yard bound, you can't move. And so my job was to take out the trash and to make sure the trash went out at either, you know, neutral dollars or preferably to make money at it. And it, what it boiled down to was finding a home for the bark mm-hmm. and it turned into beauty bark that people put in their gardens mm-hmm. and, you know, various things you can do with that. Um, but this is another use you can do for that. You can, you know, at- attach it, attach a biochar plant to a lumber mill. You know, someone who's producing this stuff all the time, food processors like down in the Tri-Cities would be another great place to put in a biochar plant because they have, you know, continuously generating f- Wood, you know, waste their slag. You know, it's like, what do you do with your slag? Do you send it to the to the landfill and let it rot? Do you send it off to a composting facility and let it be composted? You know, what do you do with this? It? It's that circular economy. What do you do with this? And you know, you um, it can. That's what it's all about. Mm-hmm. So here's a question for you. Then uh, you're talking with an individual who has the mindset of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right. If I can right. go to the store to grab my groceries, I don't see what's wrong with the system. So why, why change that? You know, we're now facing a changing climate. Um, to what degree um, or impact would be uh, would generating a ecosystem for biochar production and utilization have a positive impact on, say, things like force management, um, uh, deforestation to a certain extent in a healthy, maintainable way. Uh, explain to our audience what, what it would mean to create a system uh, that it would, you know, would benefit the in- environment while including the biochar component. Well, let's take it directly to something I have a lot of experience with, and that's out in the woods right. in forest management. Um, you know, we're talking about bringing in the wood waste that's left behind. Uh, right now, you bring in, you know, you, you trip a tree, drop it on the ground, drag it into the landing, you get rid of all the branches and you cut them into logs, you send the logs off to the mill and all the branches and the whips and tops you throw into a pile and you come back later in the season after the first good rain and you burn it. A lot of good fun. Having done that a lot, I can tell you it's about as much fun as a feller can have. You want to paint your body blue, you know, (laughs) and, but you know, that's a lot of particulate matter and smoke going up in the sky and nobody thinks about the communal effects that that has. You know, the last couple of summers up here in Spokane, we've had smokes 
that, it, you know, those smoky days that last two weeks, three weeks, whatever, in August, where, you know, everybody's mm -hmm. <laughs> really shallow breaths because you can't take that deep breaths. Well, okay, well, those are forest fires that are descending upon your urban area. So there's that very direct connect there. If we can go in and treat the forests so that they don't burn in the outrageous way that they are, we're way ahead of the game. And it's not that it's been that we have done it wrong for so many years, it's that we didn't know. Mm -hmm. Back in the 60s, during Lyndon Johnson's period, the, the, forest, the guy who headed up the Forest Service just decreed that the Panhandle National Forests can produce 500 million board feet a year, or whatever the number was. I mean, it was just this huge, ridiculous claims of numbers. And so they were going in in the 60s, and they were just wiping out entire stands of forests. And you can still see those scars out there today. I mean, it takes a while for out here in the, to, for a forest to regenerate a little bit faster in the on the you know the Olympic Peninsula where they get a lot more rain, but still it takes you know 80 years to regrow a forest to the point where you might be able to go back in and harvest it again, and in the meantime you've got you know you're leaving behind these slash piles. You know, they still have slash pile scars from where they burned them. Um, you one of the things that happens out here is you know you create you do a clear cut that is a simulated. Um, wildfire. You know, you're wiping out everything that's there. And the first thing that comes back it is the lodgepole pine. And it will come, it can come back with a fury. Uh, we call them dog hair stands out there. It's where you'll have, you know, 4,000 stems to the acre and no one particular stem is bigger than about, oh, two to three inches. And it'll grow to 25 feet and stop. Mm. And that's it. It doesn't grow anymore. And then they start to fall apart. They start to decay. And it's just waiting for a wildfire to come in there and whoosh, and now you're, you've got the same problem and nothing will grow in those stands. It, it just doesn't grow. So the idea of creating a biochar plant in the local area, the goal is, and we think, you know, I'm pretty sure we can do it, is to create an economic incentive to go in and harvest out those dog hair stands to bring in the slash piles you know, to make it pay so that it's worthwhile for a guy who's out there operating to go in there and clean up these stands. And so now you are doing habitat restoration. Uh, you are, you know, minimizing the fire risks. You are making things so it's safer to live out there. Up in, in this area, you're starting to get more more people moving out to the edge, in, pushing into the edges of the wilderness. Uh, they don't have the wildfire problem so much that it'll burn them out that you see in things out here in the, in the Intermountain West. Um, and it, um, it just kind of goes on and on. I mean, uh, we've talked a little bit about, uh, you know, down in Arizona, one of the problems that they have is lack of water. Well, it's not necessarily that they have a lack of water. It is they have lack of surface water. And they have these juniper that go in there, juniper, juniper and tamarisk. They send these roots down into the aquifer down below, and it sucks up all the water. These trees, yeah. Exactly. Jun juniper trees. And they're trash trees. They're, mm -hmm. they're not naturally there. What happened you know, when the Spanish first came out into that area in the 16-whatevers, um, that was the very edge of the, of the prairie for the, you know, the middle of the United States. And it was all grasslands. Mm -hmm. And so you think grass, well, of course you run cattle, right? Well, you run cattle and the sharp hooves of the cattle start cutting open the thatch. And that allows these trees to get, gain a foothold. And it just starts going and going and going. Uh, during the depression, Lyndon Johnson came into the hill country and said, let's get rid of the mesquite. And when they started this mosquito eradication program, they discovered that water started flowing. Mm -hmm. These streams started flowing. And so, you know, you start doing this habitat restoration uh, and you get a, a greater variety of birds, a greater variety of insects. You get a greater variety of the predators that, you know, just going, you're creating a whole new food chain where you are releasing this ground from what it has turned into and trying to turn it back into what it was uh, before folks like us got in there mm -hmm. and started doing things because we knew better. And so it's, you know, it's learning to live, you know, pick your spot in nature almost and trying to learn how to live within the parameters that the world wants to operate rather than imposing your will.
Yeah. I mean, we're starting getting you know into a high level f- philosophy here, but that's kind of what it's about. Yeah, ecocentrism. I like that word. Yeah, I, I do too. I think that's um, that's really an amazing story too about the juniper trees. I can't think of a, a more um, robust circular economy approach than to go in, restore the habitat. Uh, climate change to us is still a story about water. And so it's always about water. Yep. And even areas in the American West that are drought stricken right now, they're still going to get rain. It's just going to come in bursts. Yep. And so being able to get it back into the ground, recharge aquifers, if that helps, um, you know, if that helps that cause wonderful. And then at the other end of it, you're creating a market for this carbon sequestering char that is going to, you know, solve the CO2 issue on the other end. Um, but I think in the end, there needs to be market incentives. Do you sense that that is happening? And um, if not, why not? It's beginning to happen. Yeah. Can we talk about char and concrete? Absolutely. All right. So this is how we met. Am I allowed to tell this story? Absolutely. All right. So this is how we met. I met Kevin over at North Idaho College, and he was, it, it, we, we clicked immediately. We, we're both these tiggers, and we bounce. Um, I introduced him to the concept of biochar and what we were doing with the biochar and he got excited and that of course got me excited and we started bouncing things back and forth and the next thing I know I'm talking to you guys about char and concrete and one of the things I love about char and concrete is that it provides the char manufacturers with a very large offtake with almost no product development so you, you guys have got a concrete that's already 10% of what <clears throat> the uh, Portland cement carbon footprint is, and the, you start taking this char and throwing, which is almost pure carbon, it's like 85% carbon, and you start throwing it into, the, into your already 10% of what a normal footprint of, of, of concrete is, and now you're driving this concrete that you guys are making down to net zero, sub-net zero. I mean, it is not just zero, you know, creating the concrete that's zero carbon footprint, but it's actually sequestering and going down to a zero, below zero carbon footprint. And then you start adding in to the uh, avoided carbon, because this is not your father's concrete. Now you start talking about in in the carbon economy, you're talking about avoided carbon, you're not producing it. Mm -hmm. And same thing with the habitat restoration, you are not producing these particulates, the carbon's going up in the sky, you're not doing that which I think is really one of the parts that I find most exciting is the things that you're no longer doing in order to create the things that you need for civilization to occur. And you're just totally rearranging the way you're doing it. And that's what I, you know, I get pretty excited about char and concrete because it's, you know, as I have said before, you know, we solve each other's problems. We drive you guys down to net zero, um, sub net zero and, it provides us with the ability to have a large offtake so that we can have a 20,000 ton a year plant here in Kootenay County and there's a place for the carbon to go. Yeah. And oh, by the way, we're also producing uh, renewable natural gas and oh, by the way, we're also producing residual heat and oh, by the way, we're also producing power. But our slag, you know, going back to taking out the garbage, right? Our slag is this biochar and now we got a place to put that. So we end up with running a log yard on one side because we're bringing in the pulp logs that works really well with the local economy, the, the logging economy that's going on here. Pulp logs, you cannot turn into salt, into um, sticks, into, into lumber. So what do you do with it? Right now, they spend an awful lot of time trying to drag it down to the pulp, pulp mill down, on the, down in Lewiston. And that's a long way to go. It's a day and a half drive for a truck driver to go all the way down there and come back. Well, now if we put it in a plant in Kootenay County, we, a, a truck driver can get a three a day as opposed to one and a half a day. Yeah, it's a big or, deal. you know, a day and a half for one. And that becomes a really big deal for those guys. And we're starting to redirect this flow of pulp logs that is good for nothing. But, you know, it's, it's a waste wood product and we've got a lot of it out there. Uh, Mm -hmm. And so we're able to redirect that. We're able to create these products. And at the other end of it, we've just got trucks leaving the yard. There is no slag. We have no slag. 
there's nothing left. Yeah, it's everything, amazing. Everything but the squeal, as they say in the pig farming yeah. business. Everything but the squeal. Well, we'll use the squeal too. And I'm actually really interested to uh, get more information about the the char that you guys are experimenting with on that Coeur d'Alene pilot because I see in our total you know project design actually amending soils or amending a subgrade with that rice husk dry absolutely char for water quality absolutely um, you know water treatment and then obviously uh, a different brand or a different type of char in our concrete to get us down to net zero um, so to me it's it's all fascinating and it's very exciting and um, we complete each other's puzzle we do we we complete each other's circular economy yeah something like that it really um, it really does come at a good time too because uh, i was just i pulled up the other day a uh, research article uh in on nature.com and it's waste derived biochar from water pollution control and sustainable development it talks about biochar from wastewater from stormwater the versatility of biochar study coming from overseas so it's not just the u.s or the pacific oh. northwest it's thinking about this this is now becoming a global conversation absolutely it's now how how do we connect the dots and how fast do we do that um and so i think you know the, the time is here and now these biochar studies that you're talking about if you look at the date on them you get one or two starting to pop up in 2014 2012 and then they really start coming on 2019, 2020, 2022. I mean, many of them that you see you know, that, you know, it's doing this, it's doing this, you know, all of the things that the biochar can do. These these white papers are all dated 21 and 22. I mean, you know, like six months ago is when they first hit publication. This is all cutting edge science. Mm -hmm. Nobody really knows what it can do. Nobody know, really knows what the full saturation point of this char is when you start talking about stormwater uh, applications uh, or any application, you know, if you're trying to sequester a heavy metal or phosphorus or whatever, um, you know, it's a one cubic yard <laughs> of biochar will have about a hundred square miles of surface area that it can sequester these metals with. So it's wow. like nobody really knows what it is. The guesstimate on this uh, E. coli study that was done up in Minneapolis is every 15 years you have to recharge it, maybe. Nobody knows. Mm, yeah. Nobody knows. Yeah. The Wild West. We don't know a lot about the human brain still. We've been researching a long time, so it's time for biochar <laughs> to catch up. I think, <laughs> I think people what... should research my brain sometimes. Yeah, yeah, start right. Well, this, uh, start going down biochar. It yeah, makes two of us. <laughs> <laughs> It'll it, bite. Careful. It bites. Yeah, yeah. it yeah. truly is. There, there's <laughs> endless potential and opportunity for you know, us to move out of that Anthropocene and into the ecocentric mindset of saying, look, we need to coexist with our environments. We need to build with our environments. Let's not work against it. And what an incredible opportunity from a tree, yeah. right? Or from or, our or, plants. Or a corn stalk. From our seed, right? It's all of our basic human needs that we've had for so long and relied on. It's just a matter of relying on them in a different way, shape, form, and ultimately passion. So, yeah. Well, that's awesome. You, you're popular. Are you, you ringing? <laughs> yeah, I am. <laughs> Good. Well, uh, to kind of wrap things up, this has been awesome, and, and we should probably do a, a round two at some point. Would love you know, to. As we get further into sort of the development, the co-development stuff that we're working on together. But um, is there anything that you want to share with the audience? Uh, anything interesting that you've been reading or podcasts or research or anything that you think based on this conversation um our small but loyal audience would be interested in careful it'll bite you yeah it's a fascinating subject it just doesn't stop you know it, and you can go as deep into this as you want i've been in it for pushing two years now and i feel like i'm barely scratching the surface um i've you know i've done an awful lot of homework i'm ready to put some of this homework to work uh, and to do things, and this is one of the things I find so excited about running into you guys and doing things that we're doing. Uh, the pro the pilot project that we're doing with stormwater management over in Coeur d'Alene, the possibility of working with the highway districts to mitigate that which is watching off of their streets and highways, uh, working with the, uh, the uh, land trusts, with the conservation districts. These are very 
it's, it's pretty cool and exciting times to be with because it's just so, so different and so new. I mean, mm-hmm. it's old, but it's also new. I mean, charcoal's been around forever, you know, and these concepts, you know, Terra Petra, which is, you know, down in the Amazon, that this was, they, were, they had a, a, a biochar component in that. And it's just a very rich black soil. And they were most, this, these were the local natives. Nobody knows who they were. I mean, these grounds have been there forever, but they were just getting rid of their trash. And burning it and covering it up so they didn't have smoke coming up. And they were just, and this is incredibly rich soil. You know, it, it, it can do so much, mm. you know, and you've got to rearrange the mindset of what people are doing and how they're doing it. And this is something that the younger generation, I'm 65, by the way, and a um, little white in my beard, you know, it's too late for me to do much of anything, you know, because I've got a limited shelf life. But, you know, to if I can help inspire people that are as can get as excited about this as I am, then I'll have done a good thing. Absolutely. I'm looking for my replacement guys is yeah. what I'm really looking for. <laughs> uh, la- I have a last question for you and it's interesting timing based on what you said. Greg and I got an email uh, last week and we had an opportunity to um, present to the Washington State Board of Education with regards to future generations and what inspires uh, kids coming out of high school. Right. Right. What, what will make them tick? Unfortunately, we couldn't attend. But to your point, um, there are so many opportunities for individuals to get excited. Now, yes. here's my question, though, is how complicated, right? It's unknown. It's unexplored. But truly, how complicated is biochar? It helps if you're riddled with ADD. <laughs> <laughs> it really does. Because if, it's just like, well, no, 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 not ADD. Um, what was it? Um, um, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. If you're, it, it helps a lot if you're OCD. If you're ADD, yeah, it'll help you focus. But if you're OCD, oh, dude, you'll be in heaven. It, so, it so really if you're will. not though, yeah. if you're not though, and you say you decide to pick up a book or two with regards to biochar or a research paper or two, do you feel as though you're going to grow that knowledge to per, you know create opportunities for passion? Uh, that's going to depend upon the individual. You know, it's like what bites you. Yeah. You know, so, you know, I was blessed to have one of those brains that works well as, as an academic. Uh, and then it, it, I, that only lasts for so long. Eventually you got to go get your hands dirty. You got to go do something. You know, pops wanted me to be an attorney and it's just like, really <laughs> spend my life in a law library when I can be around stuff like that. Yeah. Well, look, it's, it's a huge thing. It's moving. It's like, no, I'd much rather do that. And so, you know, so often the kids, especially young men, um, are lost in the education system when they take away the blocks. You know, when you're playing yeah. with the blocks, it's like, okay, this works, it's da, 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 and everything. And then you take away the blocks and you have to bring it into the mind. You know, not everybody has the ability to do that, to be able to stay inside of a book and, and not wander off. And, just, and so we lose a lot of... Uh, kids in the education process by taking away the blocks and getting them into the books. Now you got to have the books in order to come back to the blocks. But you know, what I would say is that the blocks are there. You know, you can go out and get your hands dirty and, and remain. Uh, Marty over at Gizmo has probably the best story going. He's a fellow my age, a little bit older. Um, he was literally on his way out the door to the registrar's office at Stanford University in 1968 to check out Mm -hmm. because this place was so stupid he could hardly stand it. And as he was on his way out, he just happened to glance into a garage bay there where the machine shop was. And he sort of stopped and he went and said, "What, what, what are you guys doing in there? Oh, son, come on in here. We got something we won't show you. And they put his hands back on the blocks and he's going like, this is really cool. Mm-hmm. And it's like, okay, if you really want to know what's going on, you need to go study metallurgy. You need to go study your math so you can understand these measurements and how we're working with things. You need to go study this. You need to go study that. And then every day come back into the machine shop and put those things that you learn in a book to at the ends of your hands. And this is the guy who took the uh, IMAX camera, which was this huge platform-mounted 
uh, camera and it reduced it down to a man portable size and eventually it reduced it down to the size that is on the, sp the space station right now Jeez. in creating these IMAX cameras. And this all came from he was walking his way out the door because this place seriously sucks mm -hmm. to suddenly he's back alive. So, you know, if you want to, you know, going back to, you know, the education, you know, so it's, it's there are blocks out there that you can play with. And you don't have to stay inside of a book. You don't have to spend your life inside of a law library. Oh, God. Yeah. And, or, you know, inside of a cubicle, you can get out there and you can do things and you can make a change and you can create something. You can get your hands dirty. And you would attest to this, and so would I. You will with biochar. Absolutely. <laughs> There's no better place to get your hands dirty Absolutely. than with biochar. But well-made biochar yeah. white, which cleans off with just water. That's right. Maybe a little bit of soap, but just water and a towel, and it cleans right off. Yeah. I love Pleasure, it. Yeah, Vermont. This has been a lot of fun. We're going to do it again. I would love to. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. You bet. Bet.